Good morning, everyone. I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager at the Bell Museum, and I'd like to welcome you to Brain to Brain. All this week, we've been hearing from brain science researchers at the University of Minnesota, and we've been very excited to collaborate with these scientists and to learn more about their work in the fields of psychology, neuroscience, and neurology. If this is your first time joining us, you might be wondering why we're focusing on brains. Well, in addition to the incredible research that's being done at the university, the Bell Museum is excited to announce the debut of our original production, Mysteries of Your Brain. This new animated film will be showcased all weekend long in our planetarium, and it will become part of our regular viewing and learning schedule. So we hope that you'll be able to join us in person soon for an immersive show. Before I introduce our special guest, I'd like to share that we will save some time for questions today. Please post them in the comments on Facebook and we'll get to as many as we can in the time we have. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Boston Scientific for their generous support of brain-related programs and activities at the museum. And now let's welcome our guest this morning. Dr. Casey Burroughs is an assistant professor in pediatrics in the Autism and Neurodevelopment Clinic. She also conducts research identifying risks for autism in the Ellison Lab for Developmental Brain and Behavior Research. Today, she'll be sharing with us how brain imaging can be used to help us improve autism diagnosis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Burroughs. I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Um, let's see. So can you see my screen? Great. So um, thanks for joining me on here today. Uh, so as Amber mentioned, my name is Casey Burroughs, and I'm a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the U. Uh, and I'm also a researcher as part of the U of M Infant Brain Imaging Study. So I'm here today to talk about how we can use our knowledge of how the brain develops in autism to improve diagnosis and intervention. Um, Okay, and I really appreciate the theme of the mysteries of the brain because there really is so much that we still have to learn about how the brain works and how it develops. Uh, and I think Emerson Pugh summarized it in one of uh, my favorite quotes, which is, if the brain were so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. Um, so today I'll be sharing a little bit about what we've learned about how the brain develops in autism. Um, so first off, autism is a developmental condition, and it involves difficulties with social skills, nonverbal communication, and repetitive patterns of behavior. Um, and uh, people with autism have brains that are wired a little bit differently, uh, and that leads them to see the world a little bit differently. And um, so even the best clinicians in the world can't reliably diagnose autism at six months. Um, so the typical age where we start to see some of the behavioral features uh, for autism can be closer to 12 months, but really we don't reliably diagnose until 18 to 36 months of age. Um, and even with uh, that, the average age of diagnosis is closer to five years old. Um, and I think a lot of times, especially in the clinical area, we focus on some of the symptoms of autism or some of the impairment, but I also really want to highlight all of the wonderful strengths that uh, come with autism. So uh, autism has influenced our culture so much. So, so many of our children's stories, um, movies, um, understanding of science, so uh, theory of evolution, our understanding of how we weigh and measure the earth, um, all of that has been impacted by individuals with autism. Um, and then so many of our um, iconic works of art, um, movies, and then there are some really wonderful um, current artists as well who are on the spectrum, as well as some really binge-worthy TV shows. So Netflix, Love on the Spectrum with the really endearing Michael. Um, and, and so autism really has so many strengths as well. So um, the, the fact that, they're, that individuals have brains that are wired a little bit differently um, makes them really unique and awesome. And it's really one of the most fulfilling parts of my job to be able to work with individuals with autism. Um, so getting back to our topic for today, um, in general, autism is present in 1 in 54 people in the population, so around a 2% um, risk for autism in the general population. 
Um, but if a family already has one child with autism, the risk of having a second child with autism is closer to one in five, um, so about a 20% risk. Um, and that statistic is what informed our infant brain imaging study. Um, so this is the study I'll be talking about today. It's a large scale study at the University of Minnesota. Um, and um, we're studying how the brain develops in autism before the diagnostic period. So we're hoping to identify whether we could um, determine who might be at risk for autism before we could even diagnose based on behavioral features. Um, so we're trying to understand what's happening in autism before 24 months. Um, so I want to show a little video, and I hope this comes through. I think some of the videos get a little bit choppy going to Facebook Live, but um, it's a video that shows kind of the progression of social behaviors early in development. and 12 months, he's interacting, he's playing peekaboo. Um, but by 18 months, he's not really responding to his name. He's more focused on objects. And we're starting to see some of those repetitive and sensory behaviors, which then persist through childhood. Um, so what the IBIS study is hoping to do is to identify what's happening in the brain um, in that pre-symptomatic period and, and the period before we can diagnose autism. So we have, we've had a series of studies that have found several differences. So before an infant turns one, we see differences in um, the growth of the brain structures um, via cortical surface area, and then also via um, increased uh, corpus callosum size. Um, we're also seeing differences in how the brain is connected. Uh, so differences in the white matter fiber bundles, so connectivity there, as well as um, 
an increase in extraaxial cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so those are some fancy words that just, um, that system is responsible for cleaning the brain. So, or how the brain cleans itself. So we think that the brain might be, there might be something a little bit different that's happening there that might be leading to some clogs in the brain that might relate to some of the later behavioral differences. Um, and then we also see differences in how um, the different brain structures are connected to each other. Um, and we're seeing all of these differences in the six month and 12 month period. So those are all um, before we see any of the behavioral features that might differentiate autism. Um, and so what we are taking away from this study through all of those different brain findings is that before we start to see any changes in behavior in this first year of life, we're seeing a lot of differences in the brain. Um, and then later on, we see some of the unfolding of the symptoms in the second year. Um, so some of those social difficulties, um, repetitive behaviors, language delays. Um, and then closer to the two-year period, um, and even later sometimes is when we start to see the diagnosis. Um, and so the differences in the brain are apparent before we see that consolidation of the diagnostic profile. Um, so we're seeing differences at six and 12 months. Um, so clearly before that 18 months where we start to see some of those behavioral features. Um, so coming back to our understanding of autism, it seems like we might see early differences in the brain before we start to see the differences in behavior. Um, so, um, and all of that is before we are able to arrive at a diagnosis. Um, so taken together, when we're looking at infants who are at higher risk um, or higher likelihood of developing autism because they have an older sibling with autism, um, we think about kind of what else might put them at risk. So there might be some neural biomarkers, so differences at the brain that we can see before 12 months of age. Um, we can also look at predictors of some of those earlier behaviors. So there are certain features that we might see at 12 months that could help us identify who's at risk for autism and then other risk factors as well. And that could lead us to identify, you know, certain children who may be at really um, like ultra high likelihood of developing autism. So we could intervene even earlier. Um, so rather than waiting until we make the diagnosis at 24 months, we could intervene starting at closer to six or 12 months and help parents learn how to increase social motivation, social orientation, um, and, um, and increase their language skills so that they can have as, um, as optimal of outcomes as possible. Um, and we'll get probably more bang for our buck by inter intervening early. Um, and then there are also gonna be kids who um, have an older sibling with autism, those four and five who don't go on to develop autism, that we could say, okay, you're probably, you know, based on the brain imaging, we'll continue to monitor, um, but we were not saying, you know, that, um, we need to intervene quite as early. So we can be really efficient with our resources and how we're allocating that. Um, so we can help as many kids as possible and set children and families on the best trajectory possible. Um, so um, if you're interested in learning more, we have um, uh, several social media sites for our study. So the Infant Brain Imaging Study Network has a Facebook page and Instagram where we share lots of facts and, um, and autism-owned businesses. Um, and we also have a website here. Um, we also are recruiting families right now. So right now we're doing our uh, study collection um, from home. Um, and if you or someone you know has a child with autism and a new baby, we would love to get in contact with you. So feel free to reach out. Um, and our email list is listed here. Um, and if you have any needs for supports for individuals with autism, um, I also work in the Autism and Neurodevelopment Clinic at the U. Um, we're also called the Voyager Clinic. We have our phone number listed here. We do diagnostic um, evaluations, and we also have several social skills groups, anxiety groups, and groups for transition age youth as well. So we would love to, to have you participate. 
Um, and uh, in summary, just want to thank my whole team, um, all of our collaborators, our funding sites, and especially our families who allow us to to learn about the brain and um, and learn from them. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Burroughs. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in, um, and I just want to remind our audience that, um, that if they do have any questions, to please post them in the comments so that we have a chance to answer them here. Um, and I also wanted to let everyone know that um, I have posted in the comments the links to your, your social media sites and to the recruitment efforts. So if you're interested in, in learning more or participating, all of that is, is linked down in the comments. Um, so the first question actually came in from Olga, and Olga's wondering if autism can be caused by brain damage or trauma. Good question, Olga. Um, so usually um, we, we would say that autism um, is, has some genetic risk factors, um, but we wouldn't usually think that it's caused by brain damage or trauma necessarily. So um, those things can affect the, the course of autism, um, but usually um, there may be more of a, like the cause for autism comes more from um, genetic factors or different environmental factors. And we still don't under understand that super well. And there's a lot of work to, that's going on to, to identify what might put people at higher risk for autism. The next question comes from Brianna, and Brianna is wondering if you've noticed any neurological changes in an individual diagnosed with autism if they practice meditation or mindfulness. Good question, Brianna. Um, I am not sure that that study has been done in autism specifically. Um, and that would happen probably at a later age than what this study specifically is looking at. Um, but I do know that there are some impacts on brain activity and connectivity for individuals who do use mindfulness. Um, and uh, they, they show that regions that are involved in how we think about ourself um, and how we process what's important in the environment changes with mindfulness. Um, and so in my clinical practice, I do a lot of mindfulness exercises with my clients and, and hope that that can, that can help kind of keep them focused on the present rather than getting too worked up in any anxious thoughts or or things that that come up into their mind so I think it's a it's a great strategy absolutely thank you um, I also had a question a little bit about um, as the as we learn more about how brain imaging can be used um, to help with this diagnosis do you imagine it actually replacing part of the clinical experience in diagnosing autism Good question. Um, so I, I think that autism is so multifaceted and so complex that one brain scan is never going to be able to capture that. Um, and so really what we need is the combination of the brain imaging and the clinical expertise, but really those clinical impressions and recommendations, right? Like a brain scan is not going to say which therapy is going to be the most effective, although maybe it could in the future. Um, it could help us with that clinical decision making, but really the, the diagnosis, uh, the diagnostic process and having that clinical expertise, people who have worked with autism a lot and can share what works for families um, is really helpful. Um, so I don't see it totally replacing it, but maybe just augmenting and helping us identify who might be at most risk. Great. So understanding that it just becomes another tool. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Another tool in our toolbox. So Terry had a question uh, question that came up just or came just in. Um, and, and Terry's asking, um, as they get older, the brain is still developing. Will, is there this idea that autism can actually lessen over time? Um, and she just made a comment that, um, that she has seen that as a teen, that certain individuals can really focus on, on data facts within a certain favorite subject. Yeah, great, um, great point, Terry. And I think that really highlights some of the strengths of autism too. Um, and some of uh, the research I did in grad school actually really focused on that flexibility and, and that sometimes in autism, um, people can get hyper-focused on things and that can actually be really helpful. Like they can learn 
everything there is to know about dinosaurs or about butterflies, and they can use that to relate to other people. Um, and so I think one of the goals of our study is to help uh, intervene early so that we can um, help with the language development that are going to, that is going to help people with autism connect with other people and share their different views of the world. Um, and then absolutely the brain continues to develop up until through adulthood um, and, and into our later years too. So um, we do see that there, the differences in brain development do change over time. Um, and that a lot of times some of the symptoms of autism that are more impairing early on kind of lessen, um, but then there might be other things that come on in the adolescent period. Like I see a lot of teens who with autism who also have anxiety or ADHD. And sometimes that is more of a problem than the autism symptoms themselves. So um, that's also part of the importance of that clinical impressions and care so that we can help address some of those co-occurring co difficulties as well. Great questions though. The next question comes from Britta and uh, Britta is wondering in your perspective, what are maybe the pros and cons of fMRI versus other imaging approaches? Yeah, um, well, so fMRI um, is kind of uh, um, one tool that we have. So functional magnetic resonance imaging. So that's when we take a picture, multiple pictures of the brain as people are doing different tasks. And why, why that's really nice is we can see what's happening over time and we can see what's happening in different aspects of or areas of the brain. But none of them, um, it's not the, the best spatial resolution is what we call it. So you don't get to see like in one singular neuron exactly what's happening um, or one group of neurons, um, but it's more kind of like bigger strokes there. And then our timing resolution is not as good as some other methods as well, but it does give us a really good big picture. And there's actually been some really cool work that has shown that there are networks in the brain that kind of fire together and wire together and work together over time to support some of the really advanced cognitive tasks that we have. Um, so that's definitely one of the more widely tools used right now. Um, and it is really helpful for when we do tasks looking or studies looking at specific tasks and then also understanding larger scale brain networks. Brianna also has a question and uh, it looks like maybe she was she joined a little late so she she was just looking for a little bit of review. It looks like we have some students joining us today um, and I apologize if I if I mess up this word. <laughs> um, but Brianna's wondering if autism plays a role in the corpus uh, is it callosum? Callosum. Callosum. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that was one of the or one of the findings from our studies is that early in development we can see differences um, in uh, in the size of the corpus callosum, so the thickness, um, and we see that at six months, uh, and that the trajectory of that can look different. So the growth in the corpus callosum is a little bit different in our infants who go on to develop autism. Um, and that's also, we've seen that uh, the corpus callosum size at six months is related to later um, parent reported restricted and repetitive behaviors. So we see that that's a really important predictor for, for later, you know, identifying who goes on to develop autism and how severe some of those symptoms might be. So that's definitely one of our um, kind of more uh, informative brain biomarkers. Well, I think the, the the final question I had for you, I don't see any new ones rolling in from the audience, but um, just uh, just something that I've been interested in is that, you know, obviously in our in our current situation, um, research and and this kind of medical care and being able to, you know, take care of people needs to continue. Um, and you mentioned a little bit that you are, you know, continuing your work and still looking for individuals to participate as part of the as part of the study. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're adjusting your work in, in this time of pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. And we are absolutely, our highest priority is wanting to make sure that the families who are helping us out so much stay safe. Um, so right now, um, we are doing a lot of our uh, data collection remotely. So we would do a parent interview or get some questionnaires 
Um, and then we are we are working on ordering these really cool, um, they're kind of um, filtration system. So what it just looks like is almost like a beekeeper hat or a space helmet. And what that does is it keeps the air that the experimenter or the scientist is breathing separate and filtered from what the what the participants are are breathing. So that is something that we are working on ordering right now. They are getting some really high demand. So we're uh, we're optimistic we'll get it in soon and we'll be able to start seeing families safely in person again soon. Um, but right now, um, we're doing all of our data collection remotely, and then clinically, we're still doing as much as we can um, over Zoom visits, and so we've been uh, really flexible in developing new diagnostic tools and adapting to the current situation, and then um, what, what has been, I think, the most fun for me is getting to do more therapy online, um, because we're actually in our in our clients' homes where they're uh, where they are day in and day out nowadays, especially. Um, so getting to see how they're using their coping skills um, in session or getting to practice working on some of their fears and then, oh, their dog can jump in their lap and help them calm down after they're fighting their fears by facing their fears. So it's been a really fun transition. That's that's great to hear that you've, you've gained some new insights and you're able to continue this work um, at a rather unusual time. So Dr. Burroughs, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I want to thank you so much for your time and for joining us today to, to share this work that's being done at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'd also like to thank our viewers for joining us for today's installment of Brain to Brain. Once again, special thanks to Boston Scientific for helping to support um, this work uh, in education throughout the Bell Museum. We hope that you can actually join us again tomorrow. It's our last day of brain science programming and we'll be exploring interoper interoperative MRI technology and also learning more about how our brains grow um, from very young to very old. Um, so I've actually posted a link in the comments um, to all the live programs so that you can see what's coming up tomorrow. Thank you once again for joining us. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.